Like there, we don't have as much going on, let's put it that way. And it was an area where I can see there wasn't a whole lot of effort, um, at least from uh, you know studies of barriers for electric car adoption. And uh, so I took it up, you know, basically took it up. And so uh, <clears throat> just quickly uh, wrap it up, I wound up doing a, it wound up becoming a dissertation, uh, looking at what it takes to bring an electric car to market when you've got an installed face with a dominant technology like the internal combustion energy engine, and what does that all involve? I imagine you, you're familiar with Plug in America here, so I don't need to tell you probably more about that other than I'm a program director there. I've been with them a little over two years now. Uh, since coming on board, I was, I was hired by uh, the executive director, Joel Levin, uh, because of the fact that I had focused on the space, on the dealership space, uh, or at least on the retail engagement space. And they had, you know, they had won a contract that had helped, I think, developing that uh, RFP, uh, but they won a contract with San Diego Gas and Electric, which would underwrite doing some education and uh, training for, for dealerships. And that was pretty much the extent of the scope. Um, because I knew what I did, having uh, interviewed many dozens of dealerships, their management, their salespeople, uh, having done analysis, statistical analysis of data, power sales satisfaction data, looking at the experience of an electric car buyer compared to the experience of a non-electric car buyer. You know, I, I knew that education and outreach was just one, one very small part of what is needed if we're going to try to move the needle in the dealership space. So over time, I mean, let's just put it this way. I had kind of a big vision for what we need. Uh, Joel gave me a platform to start start experimenting with some of those things. The very first being what was scoped, which was just creating some training material for dealership. But since then, you know, we've we've had five pilots now. We still have two currently underway and a six that started shortly. Uh, but over this time now, we've trained over 200 dealerships from you know all from coast to coast, uh, rep representing over a dozen manufacturers. Uh, while manufacturers deliver the brand and model specific information to uh, their dealerships, what we focus on, what the Plugstar program, which is what we branded this program as, um, and hold everything under that, uh, it adds to the critical pieces that we find are requested by customers. And the dealerships often are not uh, either knowledgeable or equipped to answer. And these include things, as you know, federal, estate, the regional and local incentives, utility rate, programs, uh, charging, you know, where are they, what types there are, how to do it, um, how long does it take, and expertise. Where do I find someone who knows enough about home chargers to tell me which kind of charger to get and who do I trust to install? So there's a lot of things like that. The other thing, the other, um, I think, uh, threshold or, uh, that we, we just achieved recently was uh, I just came back from Washington, D.C., where Audi had invited me to uh, train their entire um, regional sales support staff across the U.S. Uh, in one place. It's been a marathon day. We had five sessions that had roughly 400 uh, Audi corporate sales uh, support staff that rotated through. And these are the folks, these are the corporate folks who support the dealership, the Audi dealership that are out there selling. And we're hoping up until this point where we've been engaging with dealerships that we'll be doing more direct engagement with automakers who will help cement some of these uh, programs and even start um, chipping in to fund them, uh, to get dealers what they need as they start to roll out some of the vehicle, uh, some of the new vehicles, and to start taking it more seriously. Uh, some of our partners, right, uh, we all know uh, it takes a village, and this is the, the electric space, electric car space, no different in that regard. Uh, so we have a host of partners. This is not something I wanted to embark on alone. Uh, one of my key findings from the work that I had done over, the, over several years was that, you know, there had been a lot of one-off efforts by a lot of, I think, well-meaning organizations and, and people, but it, most of it was done in isolation, and therefore we lost opportunities for synergies uh, to really lash up everything and get the full power of everyone working together in the same direction. And so, as a, just a working principle, as I try to enable this vision, I wanted to make sure that we were uh, keeping the tent open and bringing others under the tent to help us out. 
right? So Electrify America is an example, and of course, uh, the dealer associations, the utilities, um, even tool, uh, tool developers, and of course, the Electric Auto Association uh, and DOE Clean Cities, for example, who have been extremely uh, helpful partners in, you know, in, in a number of ways, and I'll talk about that in a little while. So why am I here with you? Why have I been invited uh, to talk to you today? I think one is just to familiarize you with our program, with what the Plug Star program is and why it's different, uh, and why we hope it will be uh, far more effective in moving the needle, selling more electric cars. Uh, I want to share what we've learned so far. So uh, I think I mentioned we've done five, or we've already completed three pilots. We're in the middle of two, a third's about to launch. And we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot over the last, uh, we're more than two years now in doing this. And we, you know, to answer your questions, and provide uh, resources uh, for you uh, personally or to share with others. As you know, uh, this, is a, this is about getting the word out, about positive word of mouth, about building uh, support for a new technology. I'm sure you're all familiar with the national EV trends. You know, this still gets, I, I'll be honest with you, this chart still gets, I, I get snickers and scoffs when I show this chart in front of industry folks, mainly because of the fact that we're still in the very low single digits, uh, regardless of that inflection point that you see here where we're just at a little over 2.1% now um, nationally. But on a regional, uh, on a regional standpoint, it's it's the picture looks better based on where we're looking. California, of course, is a key one, and many of you have seen this one. This one, uh, of course, we haven't updated this one for the end of year numbers. But uh, I'm looking forward to seeing it because uh, I know we've broached 10% or almost. We touched on just shy of 10% in August uh, last year here in California. And as Tesla's volume ramp really uh, takes hold, I think we could be penetrating into the double digits here soon enough. Uh, some of that is, a, a, is shown here, where you can see in August, we had 9.9%, which is when uh, Tesla was coincided when Tesla was making a big push for deliveries uh, in, uh, once, once they were hitting a volume of about 5,000 vehicles a week. And the Tesla ramp is really raising stakes across the board. Uh, however, I want to, I think, offer some of my insights on this industry. Uh, I think what we are seeing here is, what we're going to see here, is we're going to see a greater and greater shift toward the premium segment, an introduction of models in the premium luxury segment, and less of an emphasis in the mass market, uh, at least for a little while. I consider it kind of a holding pattern. Uh, part of this is because we're still, at least from where manufacturers stand, we're still a <laughs> generation away, possibly two generations away from profitability at the manufacturer level. And this means that they are going to be incented to continue to slow roll these products to very carefully control the deployment of these, uh, of these vehicles to minimize their losses. What changes the game is Tesla, of course. And because Tesla uh, has done, essentially has done what no one thought they could do, which is um, park themselves right in the middle of a very valuable and valued uh, mainstream segment like luxury mid-size vehicle or luxury, um, you know, compact or entry luxury vehicle and steal share, significant share, away from their, you know, the dominant players there. And these are companies that have been around for over a century and are a foundation, right? We're talking Mercedes-Benz, we're talking, uh, you know, BMW, Volkswagen, or I should say Audi and Porsche, which own those brands, uh, which is owned by Volkswagen. So uh, it's, they didn't do it sneakily. You know, those of you who might be familiar with the disruptive innovation and that theory, you know, that's one of the things that I studied when I was working on my dissertation. Uh, Tesla doesn't fit the academic description of a disruptive innovator. Um, and the reason for that is one thing you never do as a disruptive innovator is make yourself obvious. Uh, and Tesla did that. 
the way innovators, disruptive innovators work, or at least are supposed to work in theory, is that you stay low on the radar, hope that the dominant players don't even realize that you're stripping market share away in, the, in, in low margin parts of the market, and they start getting better and better and working their way up market. Tesla's not doing that, right? I mean, they basically just took a big, <laughs> you know, planted a big flag and stole share away. And as a result, now the luxuries are panicking. And I would say not just now, I'd say this realization came a year, two years ago, um, as they were watching share and knew this was coming. So yeah. you're seeing now a lot of introduction of new stuff, right? We're seeing the Jaguar I-Pace, the Audi e-tron. Uh, you'll see it's going to be probably something not until next year, the Mercedes EQC. So these are the response. And you notice these aren't plug-in hybrids. These are meant to be quote-unquote Tesla fighters. We'll see, right? Um, the key thing is that EVs mesh with customer, key customer wants. This, uh, this was data um, shared with me by Electrify America. But if you read some of these things, like, you know, I prefer a balance of comfort and performance. I prefer superior handling and cornering. I prefer vehicles that provide a soft, comfortable ride. I want the quietest interior. I mean, doesn't this all strike you as exactly what an electric car delivers uh, in, in many ways uh, better than a conventional vehicle does? So that's, that's good news. The other, you know, non-surprising finding is that robust infrastructure matters. Right? Tesla essentially took ownership of the, uh, the fueling infrastructure and consequently removed one of the big objections. This is something we're still waiting to see from the manufacturers. <coughs> I can say that Audi has done, um, taken one of the first steps in their partnership with Electrify America to take a page out of Tesla's playbook, which is to deploy a, a phased but, but large deployment of electric, fast electric, fast charging infrastructure over the next several years. And, uh, and I think we're going to see more and more of that. Um, so I'm going to step back and just provide a little bit. I touched on disruptive innovation just a moment ago. So I want to step back a little bit and give you kind of the framework as to where the vision for the Plugstar program came from, which was really out of the literature for marketing high-tech products. Uh, and then you know, we can lump products into two large categories. We can, do, we can declare them as e incremental products. We can declare them as disruptive uh, or radical, or some might call them revolutionary products. Uh, incremental are basically products where they're gradually improved over their product cycles. Um, there's no major changes on behalf of the customer that they have to make. There's, there's, it's basically just a slightly better mousetrap. With a disruptive product, you have uh, a couple of couple of key hallmarks. You know, one is you've got a step change in terms of the customer's interaction with the product. It's not a, a slight change that's required of the customer. It's now the customer has to learn something new or there's behaviors with the product that they're not used to seeing and require substantial adjustment. The other big uh, litmus test for disruptive product is that the customer it introduces dependency by the customer on a new and emerging infrastructure that is not yet fully built out. Um, and as a consequence, you know, if you, it is a disruptive product. You there are diff, there's a different set of strategies for bringing that type of product to market as opposed to an incremental product. And the sales channel you choose to do that for. Uh, and that all of those things affect product performance. So in an incremental world, which is the auto industry up to now in the last century, you know, it's basically sales driven, right? The market is mature, the infrastructure, fueling, support, service is all built out, and it's volume centric. It's all about moving metal. It's to fulfill demand, demand already exists, and really just to provide warranty support, you know, repair and the like. On the other side, is, the, is on the disruptive side, you have to recast that as a market-driven effort because here you, you don't yet have demand. You have to create demand. You have to stimulate demand. At the same time, because you've introduced new changes and new infrastructure, you've got to discover what the customer's needs are all over again, from soup to nuts. And that's a learning process. And then experimentation process. And thirdly, you got to deploy, once you figure those things out, is to deploy what's called a whole product ecosystem or support ecosystem. Hence, going back to it takes a village. This is where we come in, right? So 
here's where we are. This, I think this <laughs> kind of captures the sentiment. <laughs> You know, manufacturers have spent millions, and we're getting now tens of billions of dollars uh, on making electric car technology better than or, or sorry, just on par with conventional vehicles. Um, maybe better in some ways, but on par is really what they're aiming for. A concomitant amount has not been spent on marketing and selling these vehicles. And when you take a disruptive product, and like an electric car, and you introduce it into a sales channel that was uh, that was not designed for handling a disruptive product. You get, um, in business speak, you know, market frictions. You get, you get frictions. You get pain points, issues, and so that's what I'm going to talk about. Just that uh, again, continuing to set the stage here. Um, what when we have a disruptive product, as I just described, what that does is introduce even more risk, right? And the, a car is already a risky purchase. It's the second most expensive purchase for most people next to a home. Now you're introducing a disruptive version of this product and it's riskier in, in a kind of a step change way, right? So that creates this whole dynamic of where you've got early adopters. Um, you, in other words, you have less, people kind of segment naturally into groups where the first people interested in buying it are those who are, uh, more risk tolerant, less risk averse, want to be the first on the block to have the latest and greatest technology, or they're driven by values uh, such as the environment or whatever it might be, uh, you know, independence from you know foreign oil, whatever it might be, um, or maybe it's just you know, driven by economics. But in any case, that's um, that's where you get that, and then you get the early majority, the late majority, and the lag the people who are still walking around with their flip phones from 2004. Um, so you probably remember most people in here here uh, here I'm sure do remember the Apple Mac versus Windows PC battle, right? Um, and this is a this is just a page out of that same playbook where you had this this young upstart company Apple, you know, led by uh, you know a very char charismatic, enigmatic uh, innovator Steve Jobs, and they are introducing a new product that is better in a number of ways. Uh, it's, back then the Mac was a quote unquote portable machine relative to the rather large bulky IBM PCs at the time that were driven by Windows, but it had some neat features with it, right? It was much easier to use, yada yada. Um, at the same time, though, it was also almost twice as expensive, at a pretty <coughs> substantial premium. And this was sold through third party retailers who really couldn't, really couldn't justify that, uh, convey that value proposition to customers. And for that, for that as well as other reasons, the product didn't, didn't sell well. And Apple, of course, as we know in history, um, barely survived, right? With this kind of core cold following. Uh, later, Jobs came back to Apple, as we know, uh, big vision for introducing disruptive innovations uh, and chose that more control over the sales channel to do it by opening factory stores, as we know. So therefore, Apple had full control over it and the experience. And before rolling out, as we all know, right, it was the iPod and the iPhone and the iPad and everything else. Um, so that's, that's, I think, the analog to what we're witnessing now in the auto industry. Um, and uh, the thing is, it's even more, it's, it's even, the barriers are much higher now uh, because this is such a highly regulated industry. It's also much slower product cycle wise. You know, a, a cell phone, Smartphone, uh, the computer, I mean, it's about what, 18 months? You know, now it's shorter and shorter and shorter, you know, part of the product life cycle. A car, of course, is still a very long lived um, product. But what dealers have to deal with is two kinds of customers, right? They got the early adopter, the, the, basically the cult follower who, you know, have been with the pent up demand, the people who have been waiting for this all their lives. <coughs> I might be speaking to some of you here. <laughs> and, uh, and the others, right? The cross shoppers, these are the people who, you know, they they have to be convinced. And so dealers now have to contend with both of these profiles of customers. So I mentioned pain points earlier. Right? When you take a disruptive product and you introduce it into a sales channel, like it's not very incremental. So the pain points we're familiar with for customers, that's one wall we got to get through. You know, it doesn't work for me. Uh, how much is it going to cost? Uh, 
you know, what kind of equipment do I need? Uh, there's range anxiety and all these other things. But there's also this substantial barrier on the dealer side, and it's because of this whole uh, too much work for too little reward problem. That's that's the layman's way to state it. But that is the bottom line core root cause problem that we face in the dealership sphere. Uh, and that's things like low initial sales volume. Initially, they're one, two, three, maybe five percent of their sales. They have to invest. They have to invest a lot of money in the charging. Uh, equipment and new lifts to be able to handle the batteries that are in the end to be OSHA compliant and everything else. So it's not an inexpensive uh, step from a facilities and training standpoint. This industry is high turnover. So why do I want to invest this kind of money in salespeople who are just going to leave my business in six months and go work with the dealer down the street? So there's all these other things, right? And then the EVs add the, these, the, the fact that it's unfamiliar. See, right now, any of the, they, they have salespeople, right? Salespeople have been driving cars probably since they were a teenager and got their learning from it. But they, so anyone can step into a role and not, you know, if, you have, if you're a salesperson kind of person, you could sell a car. Not the same for an electric car because they have no base of knowledge going into the job. They've never driven an electric car. Um, Paul's got excluded. But, um, you know, that's what we're up against. Complicated incentives, insufficient tools and resources. Because, you know, I mentioned in the earlier screen on disruptive products, right, the automakers actually have to know what the customer's needs are and, and to equip the dealers with the tools to help <laughs> facilitate that for the customer. And that's been slow coming. And, uh, you know, limited availability across uh, categories, right? So we've seen these batteries come first in the compact, subcompact, um, and, you know, mid-sized sedan. We're still not seeing, and just now starting to see, you know, S entries in larger categories. And unfortunately, we already talked about gas prices, right? That's a headwind that has not been helping the situation as the people are migrating in droves, right? To large format vehicles, SUVs and trucks. I think cars are down to what, 30% of sales. So that's, those are just some of the headwinds. Um, so anything that we do to try to bring, uh, to, to grow electric vehicle adoption, we have to tackle both of these barriers. We have to attack the, customer, attack the customer barrier, but we also have to recognize the barriers of dealerships and drive that down as well, address the too much work for too little reward problem. So the vision for Plugstar, uh, it's taking me a while getting here, but thank you folks for bearing with me, <laughs> is to deliver an end-to-end -end solution. Uh, and that, it looks like this. It looks like three big elements. One is consumer tools. Because ultimately, the dealers have to move people through. If we're going to do this through the franchise system, and, and that's another thing I should mention, franchise dealers, there's roughly 17,000 independently run businesses in this country. Trying to get them all to even be open to the notion of changing their business model ain't going to happen, and it's ain't going to happen overnight. It's going to take a long time, and we don't want to wait for it. So you got to work with, the, with what you got. What we got are independent dealers who are going to do things the way they want to do them. So we got to work with that model. So the way to do that is, hey, if they're selling volume, then we got to get the tools in front of the customer so that the customer can get all the information they need before they ever start interacting with the dealer. And that way, when the customer comes to the dealer, the dealer can basically do what they do best, which is transact a sale. They just want to close a sale, move to the next customer. So that's what I, when I talk about the partnership, right, the stakeholders, the, uh, the village, this is where I think there's a real role for partnerships like ours with uh, Electric Auto Association and others, which is to, to help do that work, the front end work and the back end work, because a disruptive product isn't like the old, the old, your father's Oldsmobile, right? You don't just hand them the keys and, you know, you're done, come back in five years or whatever when you need a new car. The customer has got to be set up for, to have a good ownership experience. So to do that, to help us do that, rather we have limited resources, right? So we're not gonna go to every dealership. There's hundreds of dealerships in metro areas, which don't have the resources to do that. On top of that, remember I mentioned about the one thing about disruptive products is you get the adoption curve where you have innovators and early adopters who would be the first hand raisers. Yeah, yeah, me, me. It's the same thing with the auto dealers. They are just another body. In fact, they're the first body <laughs> Of electric cars because they buy them from the manufacturer. You get the same dynamic. So let's work with the interested, the willing. So we do that. 
And then we give them the train, we give them the training and the resources that they need and, uh, and even support their customers uh, to make sure that they have a good experience or set up for a good experience, ownership experience. And then we reward them because I got that's how they do business. They don't do anything without something being waved in front of them. That's the whole way that they, it's their MO. You gotta work with their MO. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But in our cycle one, what I call our cycle one, rather than phase one, because we've had different phases for our pilots. So I'm just gonna, to, to avoid confusion, I'm just gonna use cycle one for this particular. But the, our first offering was really that training that I mentioned. Just let's get trained, let's get the right material in front of these dealers. And it's not just, here's the different rebate programs, because that's not enough. What's important is how do they convey that information to the customer in an effective way? So it's translating these things into language that the dealership can then say to a customer that the customer gets it, remembers it, and it's a benefit to them. Uh, not a complication or confusing thing that they got to go out and do some complex math uh, and the like. So, I mean, the, our cycle one just had some basic stuff, right? We're going to try some stuff. It was you know, a training manual. It was a one-stop, just very rudimentary, flat file-based web page for dealers, right? Because one of the big complaints that I learned from dealers was they got to go to visit you know, umpteen different websites to try to figure out what all incentives apply here, federal, state, local. They don't have the time for that. They don't have the patience for it. They're not going to do it. So I tried to give them a one-stop shop. We implemented this as a pilot in San Diego, Los Angeles uh, in the first year. And back then it was really just me. I was, uh, as of March last year, I brought on the second person on their staff, the program manager. Cap uh, to assist with this uh, and close out the uh, the LA and Boston programs. The San Diego one had already ended, but we learned some things just from those very basic things that we were giving the dealers. What we we learned that because we surveyed both before and after, we learned what we did well was that the training was pretty much right on the material. That's what they needed. They needed all this EV ecosystem stuff, but it needs to be translated into the retail space in the way that the dealer conveys that information to the customer. And then the other thing is, we were told by automakers, you'd be lucky to get half an hour of a dealer. We got a dealer that committed to a half hour's time. You know, our training sessions were off site for three hours. In fact, originally it was a half day. We even did one that was a full day because the feedback we were getting was, you should make this a full day. You know, it's so as much as we would like to do that, what we've kind of settled on is about three hours on site. And that's for advanced training, as we've now come to realize, and we'll get to that today. But they also valued hearing from other dealers. We bring all the dealers from the different manufacturers all together in a room. That way they're away from all the distractions. Uh, and they can trade war stories. They learn from each other. We've got a mix of experience. Some old timers who have been selling EVs for all of six years, three or five years. Others that are newbies have just been thrown in front and say, go sell them. Uh, and that's helpful. And then, of course, we give them a reference binder. But we also learned how we could improve, you know, more two-way interaction instead of me up here just lecturing uh, to them. You know, we would uh, try to get them to talk about more about their experience, helps them get get them more engaged and involved, uh, distill the content to key talking points or what we've done is selling points. Uh, that's one thing that we learned that's key. Uh, more training options, uh, deliver and how we deliver it, not just in an offsite like this. But you know, doing it in dealers, and say a one-hour increment, smaller increments, offering it online or module short modules online. So we're now developing those pieces. Um, customized training specific to the manufacturer's models. Obviously, a, you know, say an Audi dealer who's selling uh, just e-trons, uh, which are all electric, they don't need to be bothered with plugging hybrid stuff. So let's just focus on uh, on the all-electric. And then more training aids, and of course, incentives for dealers. Love that, right? So anything you can give them. So our cycle two, after learning from those three pilots, uh, our cycle two was the first to finally deploy a full end-to-end -end solution uh, for these three uh, pillars. Uh, sorry, that was the old, um, that was the old, uh, I know it changed it, that was the old um, uh, triangle. But uh, the first is that we have qualified dealers and retail stores. Um, and the qualified dealers look like this. We designate two or more staff, we support local out uh, that they commit to supporting local outreach event. Um, they complete the plug star advanced training. They have to submit uh, two sales people for that. Um, and they have to maintain their qualified staff. They can't just get trained or and then they disappear or whatever. 
go away and expect to be, uh, you know, uh, continue. Uh, the training topics we cover, like things like the government incentives, utility rates, and programs, uh, sales best practices, since we've talked to so many dealers across so many different manufacturers, we can cross pollinate the best of each, which is something these dealers don't get, so they only see it from their own manufacturer. And uh, then we also developed a fully scalable, robust uh, online and mobile friendly solution for the dealership, uh, the salespeople, which is basically a zip code lookup. They can punch in a zip code. And it will give them the full incentive stack that that customer should be eligible for uh, from the federal, state, local, as well as the utility. Um, from a tools and resources standpoint, we have tools both for consumers and for dealers. Our tool looks like a plugstar.com. So uh, I invite you to go take a look at it. There you will see the links for consumers, for EV buyers, for dealerships, and then there's an about, a way to learn more about what that program is all. Um, some things that we give dealers, aside from the training manual now, we have a quick reference sheet, something they can just stick on their desk or on their uh, monitor. We have a break room poster now, which has the, the top selling point for selling an electric car. Um, we have the sales tool I mentioned, and we are rolling out in, uh, late next month a customer support program, which consists of 800 toll free number email support. Um, rewards, I mentioned this earlier, and by <coughs> rewards, there's a few things, um, and these are not listed. Well, these are listed, yes, in order of, I think, uh, priority, right? Yes, uh, money, right? <laughs> Wave money in front of them, you've got them, you now have my attention. And that's key, right? I mean, that's just a key point, just to get us in the door so we can talk to a manager. We really need top-down support. No salesperson, no matter how devoted they are, can overcome the inertia of a unsupportive, even hostile, management, which is not interested in selling. So the SPIF is what gets us in front of a general manager, in front of a principal or an owner uh, to support and put the mechanisms of the dealership behind it or the sales. <clears throat> Customer leads. If we don't have a SPIF, and we don't in most cases, San Diego is unique, Sacramento is unique, and what they now do as part of our fourth and fifth pilots. Um, Customer leads is one thing they, they very much value. So uh, that's the other reason we created this plugstar.com EV shopping site, uh, because we feel we felt that that was a big missing piece. You have all these different trusted third-party car shopping sites like Edmunds.com, CarGurus, Kelly Blue Book, uh, but none of them do a particularly uh, good job with helping a customer navigate the new considerations that they have. They just when they're buying an electric car, they just treat an electric car like it's another vehicle category, like a minivan or a crossover. And we all know it can be any of those things and none of those things, right? So um, uh, that that's something we felt was important. But that's also a lead generation platform, right? We're going to do all this, all this effort, not just us at Plug in America, but you, Electric Auto Association, the utility, or the government agencies. We should be funneling any of our monies we spend for marketing and outreach. We should be funneling as many customers as we can to the dealers who are bought into this because that gives us leverage. We get power. They like this. They value this. And that helps us modify their behavior, which is ultimately what we want to do. Right? And then thirdly is recognition. Uh, so recognition is just give them a recognize them, you know, give them a certificate. You, know, you completed the advanced course. Uh, you're now an EV specialist one. We're going to have additional courses that will follow. You can become a specialist two, specialist three, and graduate up. Um, and, and that's recognized from dealer to dealer, and hopefully will become value over time. The stuff dealers are used to is how to play their ball game. Uh, the other was trophies, right? They love the any dealership you've ever been to. They even got a trophy case. Usually it's the first thing you're walking past when you walk in. When you're sitting at a desk, they probably have little trophies for this and that, you know, a J Power Award or whatever it is. So we're doing that now too. We're creating little trophies for them. They take back and put on their desk. Right? I'm a plug star, you know, certified UV specialist. Um, and then and finally awards. So you know, recognizing them for achievements, like actually selling the most EVs or perhaps having the greatest percent increase in EV sales as a proportion of their sales, things like that. Um, so our Cycle 2 solution, I mentioned, deploys an end-to-end -end, uh, platform. We inform customers and dealers through it. 
We certify dealers and retail points. We connect customers with trained and supported de uh, retailers. Say retailers only because I want to include Tesla. I don't want to exclude them. They, they're not a dealer. Uh, we administer incentives and reward dealers. And we're capturing data. That's the other important thing about having this online platform because you know that gives us the way to, to see what's happening during the customer's journey. Are they buying an electric car? Why? Are they not buying an electric car? Where did we lose them? How can we fix that? We don't know the problem if we don't have visibility to that. Um, and then there's the uh, e-learning platform, <clears throat> which is in development, as I mentioned, through funding from San Diego Gas and Electric. Uh, and that's what we're planning to use for refresher training, create modules for these dealers to keep their, so that they can keep their certification current. As, the, as you know, this is a very quickly evolving industry. And uh, we achieved all of this, not, you know, Plug in America is, you know, I think when I joined, I think I was the sixth, fifth or sixth hire. So there wasn't a big staff to do this. And this was achieved mostly through partnerships. Uh, you know, this cultivating relationships with advocates who really, with talented advocates, who were really passionate about, about this and saw this vision as well and wanted to be a part of the solution. So we partnered with them, Zappy Ride and Charge Hub are two of the uh, companies that I partnered with. Teske Design was another. I'm gonna hear familiar with Matt Teske. No? Okay, one in the back. Yeah, Chris in the back there. Um, you know, Matt's one of the, most, he's probably the most known marketing guy, uh, branding and marketing guy in this space. Uh, you'll see him at the Roadmap conference typically up in, uh, up in Port. But we worked with him. Uh, he uh, was one of our core team members in developing our sites and creating a great user experience, user interface, and user experience. But we owe a lot to those uh, those efforts. And we branded under the Plugstar label. We got a, a trademark, which um, has already made it through most of the steps. But we just have to do a, a final filing here, and we're pretty much uh, set. And now um, we're deployed. You know, Cycle Two is deployed in Sacramento and San Diego. We just completed our test phase where we rolled out those three things that you saw, right? The consumer tools, the qualified or certified dealers, and the rewards were actually cutting what are called SPIFs, bonuses, uh, to dealers who sell electric cars. We were cutting checks on the last uh, September, really October. Um, and we got all the data from that. We've changed our policy to make sure that we're aligning right. And we just launched the now broader phase uh, where we have over a dozen dealers in the Sacramento region, over a dozen dealers in the San Diego region who are now participating in the Plugstar program. We have dedicated staff. That's the other thing I'm pleased to announce as of uh, about the middle of last, last year, uh, I was able to, to get on some really talented folks, folks with automotive industry experience. Um, for example, uh, and please don't, don't judge now, I brought on, you know, uh, I think uh, a fellow from Toyota Motor Sales who was uh, involved on the uh, Toyota Mirai uh, fuel cell project. Um, but before you go judging, you know, <laughs> you're going to do that. He was on the Toyota RAV4 electric uh, program uh, ahead of that. <laughs> so in any case, um, and we got field support and we grab, this is a key thing for credibility and legitimacy. You know, I've never sold a car at a dealership myself. I was invited to, but I turned them down. Um, I was honored to be invited, but uh, turn them down. But we have field support from folks who actually do have sales experience, years of sales experience um, in the field. And these are the ones who know how they, how dealers work, know how to get in there, how to talk in order to get what we need. Um, so what we're doing is we're intervening in a couple of spots here. And I'm going to move through this just for sake of time. <clears throat> but we're trying to get ahead of the customer, make them a plug-in ready customer, hand them off to a qualified or certified dealer who is uh, equipped to provide a better experience than they might otherwise get if they just went to any dealership. We created a brand neutral car shopping site which fills the gap in addressing the new considerations faced by electric vehicle customers like charging, equipment, installation. Uh, a one-stop shop for all the public incentives plus the ancillary equipment for services, uh, you know, chargers and things like that. Uh, connecting the EV customers to specially supported dealers and stakeholder campaigns that drive online traffic to a single uh, to a to a single source. The deals, really, at the end of the day, this can be multiple sites. It doesn't have to be one. Um, again, you can visit plugstar.com to see what that is for yourself. Uh, quickly on the cycle two pilot programs, 
the Sacramento one, uh, they started roughly about the same time. It was funded by SMUG uh, in Sacramento. Or this is a three-year program, um, and it's about a dozen dealers per year. We can cycle dealers in and out based on whether they maintain certification or if we get new ones we want to bring in. Um, and you know, we have a we have an incentive pool. Uh, provides about three hundred dollars per EV sold. It's split between the dealer, uh, the salesperson, the dealer. Two hundred dollars the salesperson, one hundred dollars the dealer. Um, not all of their folks are necessarily trained, so we uh, just amended our process where we they basically get the full spiff if it's sold by a trained, the parts car trained salesperson. If it's sold by an untrained salesperson, they only get half, both the dealer and the salesperson. That incents them to well, incents them to continue to get the customer release form. That uh, so that we can track what's happening. Um, and it encourages them to get trained, right? And the dealer too, to get that, that uh, salesperson trained. Uh, so we can now compare with data, how are trained dealers doing relative to untrained dealers? And through follow-up surveys with customers, because they're coming through a very, various means, through the plugstar.com site, and from the claims process where we have a release form and contact information, we can survey those customers to see how their experience really was and to inform the plugstar.com site, just like you see on Amazon or any other site or dealer rater, you know, where there's a certain number of stars based on the experience they had and that feedback and benefits everybody and the other buyer. Uh, the San Diego one is a shorter period. Uh, it's about a dozen dealers. I think we're ultimately accepting somewhere around 14 or 15. Um, <clears throat> it's a much larger incentive pool. It's a $500 per unit spiff. Uh, same thing, this one's split evenly, 250, 250 between salesperson and dealer. And they also built in about a, a $100,000 for the uh, ride drive as part of that package as well. And I, you know, I view ride and drive events just as one slice of the pie, right? I always think of the, uh, as the analog being the, uh, what do you call it, uh, trivial pursuit. Where you got the pie and you got to fill the, with the wedges, right? So the dealer wedge is the one that's largely been overlooked, a number of different and the, uh, in Edmunds.com for electric car buyers is another wedge. Ride and drive events, opportunities for the customer to actually experience the aha moment is another wedge. You have to have all these wedges in there to get harness the synergies and then think of that wedge as a funnel and drive them toward the certified qualified dealer. But what do, what do they get? They get a spiff. They get specialized training and certification. They get a reference manual. They get the selling points poster. They get mobile. They get the mobile friendly EV app, uh, sales app, which is the I mentioned zip code lookup. Uh, they get the dedicated dealer web page, which they can share with their customer. Um, that and that enables the customer to see what incentives they qualify for, so they can start taking those steps in advance of drowning the dealer with these kind of questions. Um, and the dealer gets plug-in ready customer leads when they do get there. And for EV customers, as I mentioned, we have this glove box EV welcome kit that we are going to be rolling out as part of our customer support program late next month. <clears throat> and this is a real, many of you are probably familiar with Norway's program. This is exactly what we're taking the page out of their playbook by, by making this available. And we're working with sdg es marketing group, uh, who has very graciously offered to, to help us design this. We do some very staff. Um, and of course, create a non-branded one that we can use. So we're eager to get that out and add this to the uh, solution set. I know some of you, uh, and I stuck this in here because some of you might be asking, what are the key selling points for, uh, that, that you're using in this poster? Well, this is this is uh, largely uh, what it consists of: um, cutting-edge technology, instant power when you want it or need it, quiet ride, sure-footed handling, plugging it overnight and waking up to a full tank. That is. It, that's a perfect example of how we take uh, in, in, we take a message and we we package it in a, in a way that the customer can relate to, right? Because a lot of times, and here's an example, the next one, it's like paying X cents a gallon, right? A lot of times, the utilities insist, we get their attorneys insisting that we uh, say nine cents per kilowatt hour, or twelve cents per kilowatt hour. Fortunately, that's lost. Lost on the dealer, it's lost on the customer. I don't know what the heck that means. All of us are still trying to figure out what the heck we're paying for on our utility bills. We're, the, we're two decades of the 21st century. So uh, we convert that for them. Uh, and just the like, I'll let you read the rest of these. I'm sure all of you are familiar with these. Um, this is our EV shopping site. I'll leave it 
you know, just in the interest of time, because I'm sure there, you might have some questions, I want to just kind of blow through what this is. Um, just to give you, if you haven't seen it, there's some screenshots here to give you an idea. Uh, it's dynamic, it uses APIs, so it's updated regularly. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we, we're able to convey a lot of information about uh, charging, about incentives, about uh, you know, infrastructure, things like that. As part of the normal suite of things that they're already familiar with looking at, looking at such as the, you know, the overall vehicle spec or the, the photo gallery, or whatever. Um, this is an example that I pulled from my presentation for Audi where we were talking to their Eastern uh, sales support region. Um, because they wanted us to highlight an example of just how different a car can come from one metro area to the next, an electric car. There is an example. In Philadelphia, it's roughly $71,000 for an Audi e-tron when you factor in their, their incentives. Uh, you compare that against Boston, Massachusetts, and it's $72,500 uh, out-of-pocket cost there. If you look at the operating cost of the vehicle, the total cost of ownership, and this is where we wrap in uh, not just the fuel versus electricity cost or savings, but we're also considering fewer service and maintenance with it, as well as insurance, which sometimes is more expensive. Um, and you can see there's a, a substantial difference in the cost of ownership um, compared to these two cars. So that's just an example and why it's important that to emphasize with the dealers that you've got to have an easy way to just look it up, you know, like through zip code. And this gives them that. The other thing that a customer can do when they come on this site is to get the basic idea of what the incentive stack looks like. If they want more, for example, they want to understand, okay, which of these really are going to apply for me in my situation. They can create a profile, an account, answer some additional questions, and we can then determine, okay, you do qualify for the California vehicle rebate. Uh, you are considered moderate income. You would be eligible for another $2,000 kicker or $1,000 kicker, whatever it is. There's also the cost of electric fuel, home charging and charging on the go. Um, you know, home charging, this is what people need to see. They're used to thinking in terms of miles per gallon or uh, how much do I, how much it costs to fill the tank of gas, right? Or how much they're spending monthly on gasoline. And most people will have some notion, yeah, I spent about, I don't know, 80 bucks to fill my tank, right? So that's the kind of thing that we need to be able to point to them. Now, in this example of an e-tron, that you know, filling the tank, say 200 or whatever, it comes out to be 250 miles instead of that, and it's five bucks, a little over five bucks to fill that tank. Um, that's important. Uh, and then with dealers, it's about getting them to talking about monthly costs because obviously the sticker is, is not a place uh, where an electric car shines, right? So we got to get we got to get them off the battlefield where the odds are stacked against us and. Get the customer to a battlefield where we have the upper hand, where we have the high ground, which is on the operating cost and on factoring in all the incentives. We can do that through this type of tool. For example, here, saving you know $320 a month. Um, we also get the customer ready um, by making sure that they are aware of some of the things they should think about before they contact the dealerships. And then once they do, we feature our dealerships here. Um, we have this dedicated Flexstar web page. Um, we point to the fact that they can use this for quick lookups, incentive lookup. And, um, you know, EVs, you know, one of the mess messages that I always bring to the dealer associations, I was just in Massachusetts talking to the Massachusetts Auto Dealer Association, and I spoke with a lot of them uh, at the break, before I spoke, and after I spoke. And, you know, there, it's less than 2% adoption. Uh, it's still barely even registering on the radar for them. And they just, you know, they don't see any urgency. Gas is two dollars and twenty cents a gallon. Uh, it's very cold. It's January, so it's just not on their radar. I'm just trying to get the message in front of them that they need to prepare because the day is coming, and it requires a different approach across their usual slate of of concerns, like the allocation that they get in mix from the factory, training, and you know the difference with with dealers and electric cars, you, they need immersive, immersive training. They need to be driving one for a while to understand what a customer experiences and to learn how to convey that to a customer and to earn the trust of a customer because any of you who probably know, if you've 
bought a car. How many here have bought an electric car through a dealer? Right? How many of you, of those, keep your hands up. How many of those, of, of those of you had, your initial experience was a bad one where you decided, I don't trust this guy, I'm going to the next one. Okay. So still a lot of, a lot of hands up there, and that's the thing. Um, that it, largely it's because you can lose a customer very quickly because they don't trust you. If you haven't driven one yourself, then you're going to screw up. You're going to make a misstatement, man, especially with early adopters, going to be the hot one. Uh, if you have driven one, you earn trust almost right off the bat because really most people are not expecting that when they talk to a salesperson. So the moment the salesperson says, oh, yeah, no, I took it to visit my uh, my wife's, you know, my mother-in-law this past weekend, and, yeah, we had this issue and that, but we just did this, immediately, the, the, usually the customer is taken aback, like, oh, wow, really? You, you drove it. So what do you think? You know, that kind of thing. Um, any case, all these other things, the test drive, finance insurance, home readiness, delivery, and follow-up, all have to be handled differently compared to an electric car. So what's ahead for us? I already mentioned the glove box welcome kit, um, e-learning and credential management, uh, the certification standards guide, uh, the a la carte service offering. So right now our program is a big one and it's a six figure type of uh, bill uh, on it. Uh, but we're getting like Audi, we're getting more and more requests every day for can you just come train? Can you just come talk to us about this? Uh, so we're now break, you know, doing a price sheet basically to do these one-off uh, services. Uh, incorporation of chargeway. So I mentioned Matt Teske earlier. Matt Teske is now creating his own, has created his own tool called Chargeway, similar to PlugShare or um, ChargeHub, uh, but it uses basically color-coded labeling uh, of chargers. So you can say, okay, a red circle is for Tesla. Drivers, so they, they can see on a map if it's got a red circle, it's a Tesla supercharger. It can work with that, it can work with Tesla, whatever it is. Um, uh, and then evolution of the car comparison side into a true end-to-end -end marketplace and lead generation platform. So I know that's <laughs> a lot, uh, but that's what we've been up to for the past couple of years. And I figured this is an audience that would appreciate seeing the full breadth of it. Go ahead. That's an excellent portrayal and, and uh, description of what you're doing on the sales side of the dealership. I'm interested on the service side. The uh, dealers don't make much margin on a sale of car. They make a lot on the service. Mm -hmm. And electric cars are not going to require that much service. How do you get into sign up? So, yes, it's a great question and one I hear often. Um, there's a, I have a couple responses. One is that this is going to take a while before it starts, say, eroding significantly into their one of their chief profit pillars, profit center. Um, because, as we mentioned, this isn't something that just goes from zero to 50% or 100% in the span of a year or two. It's a gradual uh, uptake, a gradual evolution over time. There's plenty of opportunity for them to adjust over time. Uh, not to mention the fact that it's you know, it's a percent times another percent, right? So if you say 5% penetration and service and maintenance is only 30% of your business, you, you it's that times that plus whatever times whatever the other percentage is that it's reducing your profit, which is about, as I'm hearing, 20, anywhere from 20 to 30%. So it's a very, very, very small number when you multiply those three decimals. Uh, so that's my first response. There's time to adjust. The second part of the response is how how you adjust, which is lessons learned from the consumer electronics industry in terms of how to handle introducing a disruptive product. You have to find alternative streams of revenue to replace the revenues that were lost by the old technology. So we have to find a way to equip dealers with new streams of revenue. Those could be, you know, a, a cut on the charger that sold. Or aftermarket equipment that's sold with an electric car, you know, say a wireless charger in the garage or whatever it is. Um, solar, you know, there's an overlap between solar customers and electric car customers. And it, uh, from the solar industry, we know that it costs about $7,000 per customer to acquire that customer. Uh, they are, we know, they've, been, they've asked us on a number of occasions, when can we do something? We want to offer a spiff to the dealers. 
in the order of hundreds of dollars. Uh, but see, change comes slowly. And we'll, we'll, I think we'll get to a point where we can do that. It's definitely on our vision plan. Other question? Back. As you mentioned, uh, Tesla right now is a big incentive for the other manufacturers to take on the vehicle. Um, but Tesla, as you also mentioned, is only producing one style of car. Uh, how do you see the, the other manufacturers getting into all of their products going electric. It seems to me that they're not going to do it on a voluntary basis. So if Tesla's not going to be producing these other vehicles, uh, yeah. why are the other, why are the manufacturers going to build electric on the other vehicles? I know this is this has always been a head scratcher. It, it always follow it's always a follow the money kind of question. Right? Follow the money and you'll get the answer. Uh, the money is this, right? You follow the, the money trail. You know, automakers, especially mass market, the reason we do not see crossover electrics or lots of SUV options in various formats is not just technological, it's, it's market, right? It's the fact that they aren't profitable yet on the technology, and those are popular segments. They need to be able to control their losses, right? The way to control your losses, and this is my humble opinion, by the way, <laughs> is it's not like they've said this to me. This is my humble opinion. It's just the economics, right? So the way to control your losses is to make sure you're putting into a car that you know isn't going to be a runaway hit, right? Does that answer your question? Yeah. A little bit. Actually, sort of a follow-up to that is, do you think, you know, the government can provide financial incentives? What about just, I don't know what you'd say, emotional incentives? Yeah. You know, as opposed to what we're seeing out of Washington now, if if there was a, you know, uh, yeah. Push. Let me let me ask you this: uh, how how many years, almost said decades, did it take for the government to come up with a compelling message for smoking cigarettes or not to smoke cigarettes? So, um, someone else is going to have to. Yeah. So um, a large slice of the consumer pie are low to moderate income uh, drivers. Mm -hmm. And in, San, in uh, California, there's a law that was passed to provide more incentive for low income folks by use EVs. Uh, many of us, especially uh, those of us who live in urban centers like San Francisco, here in Los Angeles, live in a, apartment buildings that don't have garages. <laughs> So, you know, your presentation in, it was, to me, had an undercurrent of for homeowners. And, um, and I'm wondering if there is any room um, for helping us, you know, lower income folks uh, below 120% AMI to, uh, to participate and be part of that, yeah. uh, specifically with regards to charging. Yeah, this is a tough one. This is a tough one to answer. Um, you know, I, I think I will, again, just highlight that my response is really my opinion and not necessarily the opinion of Plug in America. My focus is on where we can get the most results, the most impact. And from what we've learned from experience in other sectors like IT, uh, like consumer electronics, you, you drive adoption through for lack of a better term, you come from the from the top and you drive it down from an economic standpoint, right? Cars are introduced typically with newfangled features at the luxury end, and with economies of scale, they get cheaper and therefore more accessible to lower you know, folks in the lower socioeconomic brackets. To the extent that we are, we divert too many resources to. Um, make these cars accessible to the lower economic strata, we, it is a trade-off, right? We are ultimately, that means we're not, not focusing on those who are the most likely to be able to buy it and for it to work for them. The easy wins here, the low-hanging fruit are the homeowners, 
right? The single family homeowners. So we have plenty of people to convince on that front before we even start getting into the MUDs and other areas. Not to say ignoring, just saying that with limited resources, <laughs> focusing on where we're gonna have the greatest impact first and then broadening it from there as the price economy start to make more sense. And I know that can be, that sounds a little controversial. I, I do mean it to be, I mean, Let's face it, folks, politics often drives us to do with the market, to do things that are completely counter to how markets work. And this is, in my opinion, an example of it where, you know, I understand we don't want it to seem like we're giving money to the rich. But at the same time, um, you know, the rich or the people who are lined up in front of Apple and on the splash on the front page of the New York Times, or the L.A. Times, and that's what raises people's attention. That's what gets the word out. You ask people today, you know, to name an electric car, and they're gonna they're gonna tell you it's a Tesla, and that's because not because they're advertising, right? It's because all the attention they get, just like Apple. So on the consumer side, uh, there's a number of us who are working on EV classes for people who they want to buy EV. Yeah. And just like with the dealers, it's it's pretty high touch. You know, people. I think they can get a lot of information from a website, but they really want a person there who says, you know, I've done it and it's like this. So my question to you is we've been thinking about things like having a concierge line, you know, a phone line to your phone. Um, sounds like you're, you think that's a good idea. Absolutely. Yeah. And it is, is the reason that maybe we have dealers in the first place, right? Because it is like a home. People don't buy a home sight unseen, right? You have a real estate agent pay substantially for that information because you need to need to know all the ins and outs of that. It's the same with the ocean. And, so, and Tom, that's why I mean the Electric Auto Association and all of these things one of the advocates uh, are key, right? Because that's exactly the advisory role that is needed in this space. And, and as and as advocates we have to be uh brand neutral. Yes. So this would not go to some dealer but would have to be something that's you know, separate from that. Right. So, well, yeah. bear in mind, you know, people have to think that they don't necessarily start with knowing exactly who or which vehicle they're going to buy, okay, which manufacturer they're going to buy. Yeah, okay. So, this is Peter Mackin. I'm the uh, lead advisor at SEC. Um, a couple, a couple actually more comments and questions. Um, the person earlier that uh, talked about the emotion. Yeah. Um, California is actually attempting to do something there. And it's kind of like you mentioned the cigarettes, um, you know, where the federal government would pay that. Well, California definitely does, you know, anti smoking ads. Yes. Um, and, and, and those and have so, gotten very effective. Yes. yes. And, and yes. California is looking to kind of create an emotional uh, connection with uh, EVs. Yes. I think the thing is called the Lowe's. Yes. And, and so there's, there's that. So there should be advertising coming out soon to, to help because i will say that some of the early ev commercials that i've seen are kind of yeah. not so good yes. <laughs> um, to be kind um and then the second thing i wanted to mention was the uh, other comment about the um, uh, apartment lower income people yes. living apartments I, I think the best thing to do there is to try to get charging infrastructure in place high speed charging infrastructure so that way um, lower income people can purchase used EVs that are cheap and then they have a place to charge them quickly so they don't have to worry about charging at home. They can charge for the shopping exactly. or things like that. Yeah. So, you know, I would agree with that. And as you know, the, the whole industry is now, uh, as we've heard, there seems like there's all of a sudden shift uh, away from now plugging hybrids and toward um, you know, the skateboard, essentially the full electric skateboard mm -hmm. design. Um, I think that has finally started to sink into the industry. Mm -hmm. Consequently, you know, with more and faster charging infrastructure rolling out, um, we might see the, the mud issue being addressed through just the batteries able to do essentially what a gas car does, and the station being able to essentially do what a gas pump does. Yeah, I mean, it would still be nice to have charging at the mud. Oh, yes, it would. It seems like, at least in this area, the old-fashioned dealership model is really in real salt. 
there are companies coming out of the woodwork that you can pay to go to the dealer and get a car for you so you don't have to go through that miserable experience. And that affects what you're doing. And I, I sometimes wonder if this training dealers is essentially just providing hospice support for dinosaurs. <laughs> 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 Uh, I hear you. <laughs> that said, um, and I, you know, I've had my share of bad dealership experiences. Uh, what I'm encouraged by is the level of innovation. Exactly the things that you're talking about, uh, these new third party tools like uh, Carvana, and TrueCar, um, Fair, uh, are examples of how this industry is shifting. To be more responsive to uh, to shifting customer expectations and needs, younger generation of folks who are used to buying things on you know through Apple and Apple stores or Android uh, Android stores, and don't have much appetite for the way things have been done. So these are the pressures that continue to to push on the dealerships to innovate and experiment. There is an upside here in that. Dealers are independent businesses. So they are, they can be when they want to be very nimble and try to experiment with these things. But because they're a business or a person like any of the rest of us, you've got ones who are very innovative and strategically oriented, and you've got others who are just digging their heels and you know, they're, you know, they're gonna have to bury them before they change. So I do see, you know, there will be shake out over the next decade. Um, I think it's, you know, there's, it's long overdue. It's coming. Uh, it's, and I know it, I'm over at the Dealer Association for here in San Francisco, the National Auto Dealer Association. Um, this is, these are the pressures we're dealing with. How do we, how do we adapt to you know, all the consumer preferences, the introduction of these technologies that are fundamentally different, like uh, autonomous vehicles, self-driving vehicles, electric vehicles. Uh, so, it's almost too much for them to process. There's so much being thrown at them right now. And you know, one other thing I'd say is they need it all. You know, they need to. We need to help those who are really making an effort. You know, the ones who don't really want to make an effort, so be it. They won't. They won't take the extra time to get certified and qualified. They can do what they do, and that way we won't waste their time. On. Well, thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm wondering, I don't know what percentage of your average dealer's um, uh, profit, let's say, is connected with used cars. Um, but I'm wondering if uh, Plugstar is thinking about uh, or does anything on the used car side, which will potentially address both Bruce's question uh, and some of the concern generally about efforts being no, for a broader demographic. That's a good question, Mark. Yeah, there's, we have a product. Uh, roadmap for this, for, this, for this tool that includes the addition of used cars, which is exactly, you know, steers to that, right? Your, um, your moderate, low-income buyers are not new car shoppers. Uh, they're a far stretch from that. So the only way to get that is through, you know, the used car sites. And the used car sites are certainly no better than the new car sites when it comes to electric cars. There's, uh, there is one called My EP, which I think particularly well done for used electric cars. Um, we also, uh, it's on our roadmap. We're just uh, we're waiting, to, you know, getting the, the necessary funding that we need to enable that. We certainly can. And we're doing a lot of new, innovative, experimental stuff, like working, uh, doing pilots with individual dealerships, working with BMW and uh, East Nod dealer, who I won't name, uh, to, to pull inventory directly from their dealerships into our system uh, to match people up to a particular car, a particular stock number, and present the actual pricing. That's example. I have a different question. Um, I think one thing that's totally overlooked is that I think women are actually much more open to electric vehicles from the get-go. And um, going into a dealership for a female, like, to me, it's like, this is not my world. This is some guy's world. Yeah. I 
I'm going to mention the Tesla dealership um, in San Francisco here on the Mountain West Avenue. And there was a woman standing at her computer, and there was like three different colors of car. And I thought, yeah, it's like we're walking into an Apple store. I can I can deal with this. So I think some, something's being missed here. If you could appeal to women where they're at, I think they'll be your easy drivers like that. Yeah, there's no question. I'd love to see more. Love to see. And it's, in fact, that's one of the first, most obvious ones even before we start talking about the full, say, uh, spectrum of income levels, yeah. right? I mean, even at the high income levels, we still see predominantly men in this, you know, in this space and not enough women. Um, you know, research at UC Davis, I think, has shed some light as to why that is. Women tend to be uh, much more or put security and safety higher up in their their list than men do, whereas men place it more. We're easily distracted by cool tech. <laughs> so that that's a big factor. But to your point, it's not being addressed. You know, there isn't messaging being developed to help broach that. So I think it's uh, definitely a valid concern. Eric, uh, Guy Hall here from uh, Sacramento. Hi, Guy. Um, a great presentation, a lot of valuable information. Uh, if you were in the uh, EV, uh, Electric Auto Association chapter across the United States and you felt you had an opportunity or, or um, potential uh, dealerships would be interested in getting involved in your program, is there any way you can help kickstart that for that region? And a second question is, if you're also in a chapter across the United States and you're looking at participating with Earth Day events as part of the Drive Electric Earth Day uh, events, yeah. um, is there something you would suggest that we would try to work with the dealerships beyond just asking them to bring vehicles for ride and drives? Is there any special connection during Earth Month or Earth Day? Yeah, you're talking about in regions where we don't have a post drive program? Or do? Um, both. I would say both. Okay. Well, where we do have them, uh, we now do have a mechanism to, uh, to get their attention, right? Um, in Sacramento and San Diego, where if they are resistant or hesitant or otherwise, you know, they, they can make a commitment and fail to live up to that commitment. You know, that's the one of the important reasons of having a spend and having rewards. You know, we can put them out, we can make them out of clients, basically, we list them uh, and bring other dealers who are more willing to step up and support the community um, into the program. I just had an idea yeah. that um, you could partner the two and have a reward for being the first dealer in a region going up. Mm -hmm. uh, to part one share. That yeah. would be a joint EAA and one share reward system, and they get some great public recognition and an article in the paper. And so it's yeah. a race to be the first. Yes, no, that's a good idea. And that's exactly this is dealers are highly competitive. So this is the reason <laughs> we have these rewards that are competitively oriented. Because that, that's what drives them. That's their MO. Money and competing among themselves and among other dealers and other manufacturers. So, yeah, I love it. Um, we're plug star. Oh, sorry. Plug shares is what I know. Yeah. <laughs> that's how the crowd is real. Yeah. And if you were, again, if you were interested in bringing uh, the. Bring it to a, a region where we don't have an active plug star program. Yeah, we're actually trying to figure this out. I mentioned that all our card services. That's exactly, I think, where we're thinking is, you know, we can set something up, you know, whether it's just one dealership or a dealer group that has multiple rooftops uh, and just do a one, you know, kind of a one-shot deal. Um, and maybe that's enough to whet their appetite to do more. Hi, I got a question. Oh, hi. Um, hi. And <laughs> this is much nicer. Than yes, this time of year. I want a couple of things. I want to tag on what she said about women. I think my I have Model X I take to car shows. And people, you know, get more cars and your husband's car. I tell them, no, it's my car. And, <laughs> and I tell them, if you can run your toaster in your kitchen, if you can program the oven on your, you know, your electric oven, you can run this car. Driving is not a problem, but it's all the things in there. Yeah. It's 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 really great for women. There's nothing greasy, dirty, drippy about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah, I second. forgot to add that to the selling points. <laughs> yeah, right. That's a good one. Yeah. It's not yeah. icky. It's right. <laughs> and it's well, okay. 
Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I had them say, that was on yeah, yeah. yeah. they that said, come on, can you take it in to get it fixed? I said, what do you mean, take it fixed? Get it fixed, yeah. 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 New tires and maybe yeah. windshield wiper fluid. That's all you need. But then another point about the dealerships, uh, of course, Tesla doesn't call them dealerships, they're service centers. And they're in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. They're bringing, particularly the third and fourth quarter, they're bringing them in hundreds a day. Yeah. The model three because others just you know, to deliver it. And on the the street where all the other dealers are, they're looking, where are you guys going? Look at all these cars. Yeah. And they say, We're giving them to the owners. These cars, <laughs> every one of these cars <laughs> is sold. Yeah. We don't have to sell these cars, it's already sold. And they just turn green. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can you just, just jog a thought here and I, that we haven't touched on yet that I want to impart to this audience because I think. You're an audience who would get this and understand. I wound up pinned in a conversation last night with a, an unnamed member of an unnamed dealer association in New England, who was, I think, uh, militantly anti-Tesla. And, um, uh, and it was spent about a good hour back and forth uh, listening to the arguments, presenting my own, listening to the, 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 the rebuttal to those arguments, and back and forth it went. Um, at the end of the conversation, though, I, I did learn a lot. Um, it made me really appreciate that dealers, their reaction to electric cars is to a certain degree being driven by the, the reaction against Tesla because they view Tesla and the franchise the, as an, they view Tesla and its direct model as an assault on the franchise model. And the franchise model is their lifeblood. Uh, has been for decades, and think of it this way. I think the best way for you and I to think about this is the way uh, we think about mom and pop stores and big box, right? We've watched how what's happened since Amazon, and Walmart, and you name anybody else, everyone on Target, everyone else out there, like Costco, and mom and pop stores are just almost gone in, aside from maybe some metro areas. You know, it's, it's a real loss. We have lost, even though those are economically efficient, right, from a free market standpoint, we did lose something there. There is a trade-off, right? But yeah, we got cheaper products and no matter where we go, they taste the same. So we're not taking any risks. And that's, you know, that's what we as a society have valued. So it's, they're in that same spot where they're the mom and pop. They represent all these people who are family to them and their jobs are at risk. So it's very much visceral and emotional to them. And hence, why we're at this kind of like loggerheads. Well, this happens in every industry. People lose jobs that has to yeah. I had never felt warm and fuzzy about our dealership. Right. We love our Tesla dealership. We have Tesla church on Sundays. You know, they come in and tell us things. It's a whole different yeah. culture. <laughs> yes. oh, great. Anyway, um, maybe one more question because I do have to catch a ride and I'm going to be holding her up if I stay too much longer. But I love the questions. I'd love to stay for sure. These are much better questions than I normally get from my audience. Eric, here's a real quick one. Uh, on your cycle one versus cycle two, I noticed the split uh, changed from uh, $200, 100 for the dealer to an equal 50 50 on the yeah. second cycle. Uh, so those were both in the second cycle. We, we, the second cycle is the first phase where we actually have uh, all three colors in place, consumer tools, qualified dealers, and other rewards that can also have a monetary aspect of bonus. Um, so that's, that, those are all in the second phase that includes San Diego and Sacramento. San Diego has a much bigger pool and a larger bonus. Sacramento has a much smaller pool and a smaller bonus. That's all. There would be one more question. <laughs> All right. So, uh, actually, quickly, what uh, EV do you drive? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I hate to share this. That's that's not my question, but I, I do not. I do not. Um, I don't think he drives an EV, so let's step on to the real question. I'm just trying to think how I can turn this. I'm, I'm, <laughs> all right, I'm, 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 I'm
Yeah. Now, I have a, uh, I have a Chevy Volt, 2016 Chevy Volt that's coming up on the end of lease. We also have a 2013 Model S. Okay, All right. great. I thought I'd just create some tension. Wait <laughs> <laughs> for it, wait for it. So here's, here's my real question. Uh, I do not live close to a Tesla service center. I'm 300 miles away. And I have a Tesla Model 3 that needs servicing. Now, it was great that I could get mobile servicing. And they, within two days, were down and they fixed my issue, which was no heat in my Tesla. Uh, and it was getting cold. Yeah, they changed out a battery for me lately, and I was just bored by that. They yeah, just came and switched out the battery. No, I'm like, oh, they're... that's how you do it. Not they're... easy, by the way. It was not exactly a good, uh, uh, what do you call, it, design from a user standpoint. But hey, at least they're willing to own it. They're they're great. However, you know, when I think about other gasoline, petrol powered vehicles. You go to a dealer, you go to any shop, and you have your car fixed. So, you know, the things have to change. So the challenge is remote areas, like I say, I'm 300 miles away from anything. Uh, how do you see getting into the rural and more remote areas and actually getting yeah. EVs? Yeah, I, I mean, Tesla owns the market right now, right? So. A lot hinges on their success, and I think that's still very much an open question as to whether they can find a, a route to profitability. And there are there are many who still think that there's there isn't one, um, and many of us hoping that there is one. Right. So at some point, I do see a, you know I'm hopeful that they will find it the path to profitability. I am hopeful that they'll find a way to work to work it out. Uh, some avenue whereby they do embrace the franchise um, model and are able to reach into these other. I mean, this is a reason that automakers shifted to a franchise model decades and decades ago was for for breadth, right? It was to reach across all the recesses of a very vast United States um, and to get into all of those places. Doing that with a, a you know a factory store model is pretty tough. Um, and very, very expensive, capital intensive. And Tesla is pretty tapped out. I mean, just trying to create its own, not only the cars, but the infrastructure, the charging infrastructure, just those are Herculean tasks in itself. And they've done an amazing job doing it. So there are benefits to the franchise system that unfortunately, while, while I do agree Tesla had some good reasons not to go that on the outset, namely the disruptive aspects of the product, ultimately, I think that's, uh, there, there are benefits to the franchise system that they do need in play for reaching all of those uh, remote areas and exurbia and providing the necessary services and support in those locations so people don't have to, or the company itself doesn't have to send people out into very remote places to, to support those places. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Wow, that was amazing. Eric, thank you for giving us your time. And everyone, hey, did we have a productive, fun, we laughed, good information. We, we met some people. <laughs> we cried. <laughs> we brought in people from around the country with our videos. Um, you know, so we feel like they're here. You are here with us if you're streaming. And thank you uh, for the people watching down in Palo Alto, and, you know, if they're still there. Anyway, thank you all. Thank you for everything you do for electric vehicles. And we will see you next year. Yeah, yeah, no,